Hey, listeners, if you like this podcast, check out our other show, The Dinner Table. Listen to archive content and in-depth interviews with insiders and innovative people working with food. It's on our website, www.fredopi.com. Welcome to Study Table, a conversation about student athletes with players, coaches, parents, and insiders. I'm your host, Fred Opie, a former Division I athlete and a college professor today. A native of Charlottesville, Virginia, Kevin Corkin is the head men's lacrosse coach at the University of Notre Dame. He shares a story of how he became a lacrosse coach and how becoming a husband and father has shaped him as a coach. Where did you grow up and what sports did you play? I grew up in Charlottesville, Virginia. I played football, basketball, and lacrosse. And also ran track until I was a sophomore in high school. What year did you graduate from high school? Uh, 1977. But what was lacrosse, high school lacrosse, like in Charlottesville when you were growing up? It was really just getting started. I think I think at two high schools in, in Charlottesville were like the second and third high schools in the state to go varsity when I was when I was in school. You know, in the mid seventies it was really just starting to become popular in the in the high schools. There was little to no youth lacrosse at that time. So it was really just getting started. Despite the fact that, you know, UVA was right there and it had won championships and everything else at that point had been playing for decades. Uh, it took a long time for the game to grow at the at the youth and high school levels there. Did you have a parent that worked at the university? I did. Well, Fred, my dad was a was a lacrosse coach at the University of Virginia when I was born in 1958. He was the head lacrosse coach, the head soccer coach, and the assistant basketball coach at, at UVA. And then and then they let him stop coaching basketball when he became the the sports information director. He was coaching both sports and was the sports information director. So it was a it was a different time in college athletics. That's for sure. You know, it reminds me a lot of what Coach Simmons tells me about how he grew up, where his dad coaching lacrosse, football, and I think boxing, yeah, because Coach's nickname was Slugger, so he coached boxing. So it sounds like the, almost the same era. Certainly Coach Simmons' father was back in the 1920s and worked his way up. But it's a similar story. I got to ask, tell me about your dad and where he grew up. Was he a guy that grew up in lacrosse? He did. He grew up in Baltimore, Maryland. Believe it or not, he and his brothers, uh, all of whom played college lacrosse, and, and I think three of the four were All-Americans, they all played hockey growing up. They, they loved hockey, and back then, Baltimore was very much a hockey town. We're talking about the, you know, the 30s and 40s when they were growing up, eventually going to college. And they, they all went to the service for a couple of years. That was back in the day when you could, you know, get to, you could pay for college through the GI Bill, so... They they all went to college and uh, after the service and and then played lacrosse there. Did your dad go to one of the MIA schools in Baltimore? He went to Loyola. Wow! But this was before Loyola had lacrosse. He played hockey for Loyola, but he played lacrosse for a club team because they didn't have lacrosse yet. Kevin, you you have my head spinning because I'm I'm thinking about. <laughs> Baltimore as a hotbed for hockey. And I remember uh, my travel team going down and playing in the Baltimore, D.C. area. But I didn't know this. I mean, this is this is new information. And Loyola, being in the powerhouse it is, you're telling me they didn't have lacrosse back in the 19, probably 40s he graduates from high school? He did. He graduated from college in 52, but I guess he probably should have graduated at 50 if he hadn't gone to the service for two years. So, he recently was telling me the stories of, I said, well, how in the world did you become good at hockey back then, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and and he's like, well, his uncle ran the ice rink. He used to let my dad and his brothers in early in the morning before anybody got there mm-hmm. and so that they could skate. And, and they would they would go out, and, and the four of them would play little games and, you know, skate around the rink in, in the dark. Because he said they, they, you know, he wouldn't let them turn the lights on because that cost money. <laughs> they couldn't couldn't turn the lights on until the paying customers came. So yeah. he said they would play, you know, with, you know, under the under the light of a couple sixty watt bulbs, you know, burning somewhere, and that they were. But he said that be, that that gave them all soft hands from from being able to handle the puck in the dark. People don't know the the history of these two games that they are 
they're twins. When you look at the cross players who grew up in Canada, and that, and as you probably know, most people who listen don't know that lacrosse is the national sport of, of, of Canada. It's not hockey. And guys grow up playing ice hockey, and then when the rink uh, goes into summertime, they're playing box. So this, it sounds like a natural fit, but I'm sure it's still not going on in, uh, in, in Baltimore, you know, these two things going together. And the other interesting thing that makes me think, I just interviewed John Galloway from uh, West Genesee High School and Shove Park, you know, that program there where the kids play hockey in the wintertime and then, you know, box across in the summer. It just sounds like a fit that programs across the country should be doing. Well, I tell you, I, I have always felt like the best two-sport fit was hockey and lacrosse. I love basketball point guards, uh, you know, as recruits. I love, I love quarterbacks as recruits. But I've always felt like the best, the best fit was a, a good hockey player, a good lacrosse player, was going to really blossom as a lacrosse player in college when he, when he was just doing the one. Your, your dad goes on to play undergrad lacrosse where after the service? And Duke, he, he again another another story I just recently heard from him. He was going to go to Dartmouth, huh. and uh, but but he had come back from the service in mid year, and Dartmouth wouldn't let him start. He was going to go to Dartmouth and play hockey. He wasn't he wasn't going to play lacrosse. He was going to play hockey, mm-hmm. and and uh, but Dartmouth wouldn't let him start mid year, and Duke did, hmm. so he went to Duke and played lacrosse. Wow! So when we talk about <laughs> ACC schools. It's it's Duke that has a program back then, and I recently found out that UVA has had one of the older programs and one of the first schools to actually ACC lacrosse schools to have an African American play there. So it's it really is a deep history that we're talking about, and I didn't know this about your father. It's really interesting to me. He was he was the lacrosse coach at, at UVA from 1958 until about I think maybe 66. It might have been his last year, 66 or 67. So I'm assuming that you grew up as the ball boy hanging around the lacrosse field. I did. And, you know, that's the funny thing. There wasn't any youth lacrosse except for me and, and my brothers and, and a few other kids, the, the, the Sandell kids, you know, Bob Sandell, a longtime official, had, uh, and, and, and coached at UVA. His, his sons, uh, Michael and Bobby, we would, we would all go out. We would, we would play, uh, you know, I think probably the only organized youth lacrosse game in in uh, the state of Virginia back in the 60s was when we went out and played at halftime uh, at UVA games. <laughs> Did you go on to UVA because your dad was there? Did you play at UVA as well? You know, my dad was the athletic director at UVA when I got out of high school, and I did I did go there and play. That was obviously a huge part of it. I mean, I'm, I'm one of seven kids. It was free for, for me to go to UVA. The money wasn't the same as it is now, uh, you know, in, in terms of college athletics. And, and uh, so it made a lot of sense to go to a, a school that was free. And, and besides, it was a great school and, and a place that I'd obviously grown up loving uh, since my dad had coached there and, and then worked there for almost my, my whole life. So who replaces your dad? Is it Glenn Thiel or is it Ace Adams? No, no, uh, neither one. It was Buddy Beardmore. I was just reading uh, an obituary for Buddy Beardmore, and I guess I did come across the UVA connection. So how long was Beardmore at UVA? I think it might have just been three years. Okay, so who did you end up playing for as a college coach? I played for for Coach Adams. I had decided to go to Virginia my my senior year in high school in 77, and and Glenn Thiel was the coach, but by the time I got there, uh, Ace was the coach. So you saw uh, Theo, I believe he won, was it one or two national championships at UVA? I think they had part of two championships there. I'm not sure if he was part of the championship in 70 or if that was Buddy. Glenn was definitely the, in 72. Coach, who was your favorite athlete growing up? I'd have to say probably it was two guys. It was, it was Jim Brown. You know, my dad had coached Jim Brown in the North-South game. I just... Loved the fact that a lacrosse player was the best player in the National Football League. And it was Frank Quayle, who was a running back at the University of Virginia, who was the ACC Athlete of the Year, I think ACC Football Player of the Year, but he also played lacrosse for my dad. And and he was kind of a of a poor man's Jim Brown, if you will, at that time, being a, being a great football player who picked up the lacrosse uh, stick in the spring 
and just athletically was a little bit different than most of the guys out on the field. Frank got out of uh, UVA, I think, in 1968. You know, he was the, the best running back in the country. Um, and he clearly was a very, very good college football player. But I, I don't I don't remember exactly, you know, what happened to him in the pros. What's your birth order? I'm, I'm the youngest in my family. I am in the middle of, of the seven. So, so Coach... Holding it all together, Fred. Holding it all together. <laughs> I say the middle child typically is the negotiator. He's got to be able to deal with both the, the younger siblings and the older siblings. Is that your case, part of your personality a little bit? You know, uh, I always heard it that the middle child was the fighter. <laughs> and, and, I think, I, and I think that's probably the role that I fit better than, than, than negotiator <laughs> or ambassador. I don't, I don't think any of my siblings would call me the ambassador. That's funny. That's funny. So, so, so the feistiness we see of you on the sideline is that middle child acting out. <laughs> That started, that started fighting for seconds at the, at the table. <laughs> I love it. What degree did you major in as, as an undergrad at UVA? I'm a history major. I, I knew I liked you already. So yeah. that, makes, that makes perfect <laughs> sense. When did you make the decision to go into coaching? I, I think I probably decided that I wanted to try coaching as a, as a profession when I was still in college and working some camps in the summer. And I just really, really enjoyed it. I always loved the game and I loved being around sports. You know, like I said, my dad grew up with it. Really enjoyed kind of working with somebody and helping them get better and, and trying to get them excited about playing and getting better. And, and then I decided that's what I wanted to try. You know, but I don't think you ever know till you're doing something, whether it's, you know, the thing or not. You know, most people think of you as the head coach of a very successful program, but they don't know the backstory. For who taught you the things that you know now and made a part of your coaching toolbox? I have always been a fan of and student of coaches. So I've watched coaches my whole life and enjoyed watching coaches and have made it a, a point over the years to continue to go out and, and visit with coaches spend time with them in their programs and, and try to learn from them. The guy that gave me my first job in coaching, when I was finishing my degree at Virginia, uh, I was that, that spring I coached a high school team, Western Albemarle, with David Riddick, uh, who's still coaching high school across in the Charlottesville area. So he was great just because he loved it, you know, and he was a teacher. He was a, you know, he's still a high school teacher and, and a high school coach. And, you know, that that's kind of the model that I always grew up with. I grew up with the, the guys and, and always admired the guys that, that really considered themselves teachers and educators as, as well as coaches and coached with Ace Adams. I coached uh, at Randolph-Macon College with a guy named Jim Blackburn and, and Jim Jim's father George was actually the football coach at UVA when I was a kid. Jim was, was the football coach at Randolph-Macon and he and I coached together for three years at Randolph-Macon. The first year he was the head coach, and I was the assistant. And the next two years, I was the head coach, and he was the assistant. He was just an, another educator. In fact, I think he just retired, but went on to become a dean of a couple colleges. I spent a year out here at Notre Dame with Rich O'Leary, who just was one of the really great people you'd ever meet, a guy who loved the game of lacrosse, played at Cortland State back in the day with Mike Waldvogel and oh, Dave wow. Urich and those guys just a prince of a guy and, and was the coach here until I came in 1988. I was around a lot of, of, of guys who looked at this as a, a calling and, and a profession that, that was a lot more than just winning and losing games. That, along with my dad's, obviously, influence, that's how I look at it, that's how I look at the job and how I look at the profession. I think all of them were very influential in that way. You, you mentioned uh, Rich O'Leary, and you said something that, I have seen, uh, and that is that Cortland State heritage of some of the best coaches that have been in our game for a long time. And, and a lot of these guys, I'm finding out, you know, I played for Paul Warren before transferring from Herkimer to Syracuse, another Cortland guy. And and these guys, yeah. they, they all play together. And not only did, have they become great coaches, but they have produced great coaches. So that that's something that I don't think a lot of people know, the Cortland State legacy uh, that continues to influence uh, the great game that we're involved in. Very, very interesting. We'll be right back. For more interviews and related content, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and other podcast distributors. Also, check out our website at www.fredopi.com. 
Ask questions on Facebook at Frederick Douglass Opie and on Twitter at Dr. Fred D. Opie. For information about advertising on the show, please email us at fdopie at gmail.com. That's fdopie at gmail.com. If you're enjoying the show, check out the interview with Virginia head lacrosse coach Dom Starza. Football coaches at Brown thought I had some potential in football, but but again, I was distracted by lacrosse. I used to go out and actually bang the ball off the wall outside the football locker room before football <laughs> practice. The football coaches were not happy about that, but uh, but that was like I say, I was just you know uh, you know for, it's funny sometimes uh, picked up a stick for the first time and you just feel like boy, this just feels right. Now back to the show. Were you married when you started coaching? When did the kids come? And that, how did that affect you as a coach? You know, I got married my second year at Notre Dame. I, I had been dating a girl back in Virginia when I when I came out here. Uh, right before I came here, I was an assistant at UVA. But but I had met this girl when I was coaching at Randolph-Macon. and we So we had been dating for a while, and we got married after my first year here. She came out and, and she said, okay, you got three years to win some games and, and get us back to Virginia. Um, and so, you know, 28 years later, uh, here, here we are. Great girl from, from Farmville, Virginia. No, no lacrosse connection at all, but we met because my roommate at, at Randolph-Macon was a, a football coach here, and he had grown up next door to her when they were kids. Later, my son Will, you know, as you know, just graduated Mm-hmm. Uh, played for me the last four years, graduated last spring. Uh, and then we had daughters, 95 and 98. I've still got a daughter here, a junior in high school, Natalie. And, and then I've got uh, a daughter, Sydney, who's, who's at, uh, uh, ironically enough, she's at Randolph Macon College right now. She's she's there as a sophomore playing tennis. And then we'll, you know, play, went to Notre Dame, played here, and then graduated. And he's coaching high school across out in Seattle now. You were high school across in the state of Virginia. What what have you seen with the development of the game in and around uh, Notre Dame? There was no lacrosse when I first got out here. There was no high school lacrosse. My wife and another wife in town started the middle school lacrosse league when Will got to middle school because there was no lacrosse. A woman out here, Karen Heisler, they, they both had kids that age and and wanted them to play, and, and there was nowhere for them to play. So they started the league and got a couple, got some students from Notre Dame to, to coach the kids. And, um, you know, so that was that was really the, the, the beginning. At that point, there was high school across, but there wasn't anything before that. So all the kids started playing in, in ninth or tenth grade when they got to the high school. So he actually grew up with an experience very, very similar to mine in terms of he was around the game, you know, constantly he, he saw the game his entire life uh, and saw it, you know, I, I'd like to think at a pretty high level, um, but, but really didn't get the chance to play at all. So he was in, in middle school and, you know, besides, you know, like you said, backing up goals and doing those, you know, coming out to practice and throwing with the players. I have a 13-year-old boy and I have a 10-year-old daughter. The daughter has really changed me because you cannot parent the daughter the same way you parent the son. And it, it has softened me up with a good way, but it's also made me very mindful of my time, quality time. I've had to cut back on a lot of what I do professionally. I think a lot of people struggle with trying to be productive in their field, but now they have kids and, and you know, there's, there's, you know, things will change, I'm sure, when you get to the different phases of raising kids and even the empty nest. How did it change you as far as recruiting uh, time on films? First of all, I'll, I'll tell you this, and, and I think any any coach would tell you, so much falls on your wife. And my wife has been unbelievable throughout my career in, in the time that I've had kids, which is you know twenty three years now. She's she's just had to carry the load on so much. You know, quit her job. I think when we had our second kid, started you know just parenting full time was a was a decision that I think helped all of us because. You know, she could spend the time with them. It's so important. And, and, and it allowed me to continue to do, you know, what I felt was necessary. But you're right. What you feel is necessary changes after you have kids. Before you have kids, 
you know, everything seems necessary. Uh, after you have kids, you have to think about it a little bit more and decide what, what has to be done, what needs to be done, and, and, and what you'd like to get done and make some decisions around those things, weigh the priorities of things. I, I don't know how I would have done it without without my wife, Liz. And my players always said it softened me up because, they, you know, I think that more than anything else, I had something else to think about. <laughs> 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 they, thought, they felt like I didn't torture them quite to the same extent. <laughs> Listen, parenting informs my coaching, and coaching informs my parenting. Interesting. And there's no question about that. Uh, you know, I mean, you... You understand at the end of the day so much better the kids on your team because you've you've got a teenager living in your house. You understand the the things that you control and the things that you don't control, and and the ways that you can influence things and the ways that you that you can't or that you're very limited in how you can. And 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 a lot of it is, uh, I think, in both coaching and parenting is listen. You don't control what they do, but you can plant an awful lot of seeds can grow fruitfully in the right environment over over years. And that's kind of how I how I look at both. There's no question. It's hugely influential. And it helps you understand parents. You know, like all coaches, you think, gosh, parents are a little bit crazy. And then you're a parent, and you realize <laughs> that when you're watching your child do anything, I don't care if they're five years old and doing a little play at the kindergarten, a dance recital, or, or singing, or doing or playing sports, your heart's in your throat when you're watching your own child, right? You want nothing to go wrong. You want everything to go right. And when anything does go wrong, you're heartbroken for them. I think you have to learn how to handle that. And some do better than others. But you certainly can empathize with the with the feelings that parents have because, look, I, as I like to say, they're single-issue voters, right? They want the team to do well, but they're single-issue voters. And their single issue is their kid. Hmm. And uh, and that's and that's understandable. You know that when you're when you're a parent, you understand that. I, I think what parents need to appreciate, and and as they as they're going through it, and and but it's it's hard at that moment. Is listen, those difficult times that your kids have, they need those. Those are you know formative moments, and those are really really important times, and they need to go through some of that. You don't want a kid that never has disappointment, that never has failed at anything that never has, has struggled really really hard to have to, to accomplish something and and had disappointments in the, in, during that time I mean those are extreme those are every bit as valuable uh, as any success they're going to have you need to let them have those experiences and it's okay for them to be disappointed and 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 all of that they need to know that they've got your constant support but they but they don't need you stepping in every time they have disappointment uh, when it comes to children or success in general that everybody wants a medal but nobody wants to get shot at <laughs> you know it's just... <laughs> i like that one of the biggest challenges that you are seeing some of your top athletes come in to camp with you know i think more and more as i've coached over the years i've come to realize that a huge part of my job is managing everybody's energy and that goes from the assistant coaches to to myself to to all the players, your your trainers, your managers. You know, I mean, you can't be successful without really good energy every day. But so many of the things that we do um, can drain you of and and drain your group of of, of energy individually and collectively. And and so I really think that's a huge thing. And <clears throat> the way that relates to your question specifically, you know, when kids have been playing, listen, I don't know, I know very few kids that want to work at playing lacrosse 12 months a year, okay? They, 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 at the same time, you know, all the great players consider themselves athletes and elite athletes 12 months a year. So how do you reconcile those two things, you know? I mean, uh, you, you know, there's, there's work that needs to be done to maintain your fitness and to build your strength and and those things, you know, through a year, they don't always have to be, you know, something that you're you're grinding. I that that's that's become my least favorite word in sports, grinding, because I don't think anybody, any of us, ever started playing sports, right? Your parents didn't say, "Hey, go out in the backyard and grind for an hour, and I'll call you when dinner's ready." You were out there playing sports, and you did it because you loved it and you wanted to. And and I think so much of the burnout, whether it's mental or physical. 
comes from the demands that we're putting on kids that are just a little bit unrealistic about, about you know, what they need and want to do at 18 to 22 years old. I had a great conversation with, with uh, Bo Ryan a few months ago, it was just, you know, before he stepped away from coaching this year. And he, he was talking about burnout, right? And he, he read me an article that he had uh, – uh, from a, he read from a book that he had in his in his office talking about staleness, right? About the athletes and staleness, and how it's not related to how much time they're spending during this time, but but how it's being demanded of them, and who's who's demanding it? Are they are they doing it from the, for themselves and the love of the game, or are they doing it because somebody's making them do it? And after he read it to me, he said that book was written in 1922 by the basketball coach at Wisconsin and Newt Brockney. Wow. Um, so he said, everybody thinks this burnout thing is a new thing. It's not. It, it's been around forever. And it's and it's the coach's job to manage that situation in a way where the kids, they're not burned out, you know? So, so like in the fall, when we're finished with fall practice, the only lacrosse we do is we let our guys play box lacrosse, right? Mm -hmm. And we're not even there. I want them to play box lacrosse because I think it's great for their skill set. It's great for their decision making. It's competitive. It's fun. And they just love playing. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to be there because when I'm in the room, it changes things. And, and I don't want that to be changed. I want that to be something they're doing because they love playing. And they're just enjoying themselves doing that. We're getting plenty of benefit out of it. And we're already asking them to be in the weight room three additional hours a week or or more, you know, doing probably probably more than that, obviously, but probably probably more like four hours or more, and then and so we're getting what we need from them in terms of you know building themselves as players, and then let's let their love for the game take over a little bit. Let's let them really enjoy that time of the year, and PS have some time for some other things because when it comes to the spring, they have less time for everything, and and we need to acknowledge that. I think if you're if you want them to be excited about playing every day in practice. No, I mean, and, and I think particularly in the ACC where you got that rigorous tournament at the end of the year. And then, I mean, if that's not enough to me, <laughs> then you got to go with the NCAA. So you're right. I think keeping keeping guys fresh is, is an important. Coach, what are you reading? What are you reading that you're really enjoying? I, um, I really enjoyed – uh, the Energy Bus. I heard you talk about Energy by uh, John Gordon, who played at Cornell. I really enjoyed. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm enjoying a lot of Zig Ziglar. Uh, I've been listening to a lot of Zig Ziglar's books, and I love Malcolm <laughs> Malcolm Gladwell's The yeah, Outliers. What, what, what kind of stuff are you reading? I've I've, I've read some of all of that uh, that you're saying. You know, um, John Gordon has a new book that he wrote with um, Mike Smith, the coach of the Atlanta Falcons, um, that that's out and. And that's a, a terrific read um, because he, you know, Mike Mike Smith talks about a lot of the mistakes he made in sacrificing culture for what he hoped was going to be a little bit more performance, right? And and just how important culture is to to a team and and to a team's success and and uh, how there just aren't shortcuts to that and how when you t every time you take a chance on culture you take a chance on you know performance. And, and everything else. So that's a really good book. I, I read a lot of, I read, yeah, I usually have about three books going because I like to read biographies. And, and, uh, and so I, you know, I, or either biographies or, or, or like historical, um, you know, books. And, and then I like to read some kind of a business tome, you know, kind of thing where you get some different ideas about motivation and organization and those kinds of things. Mm. I'm actually rereading uh, Good to Great. I thought that was a, a terrific book. I'm actually rereading um, Sun Tzu, The Art of War. And, and then, I'm, and then, I'm, and then I'll, I'll read like a, a Harry Bosch novel or a, or a, you know, a, um, a Harlan Coben book or something like that, you know, just to, just to, you know, pass time. Sometimes it's nice to to turn it all off and just read something that's, you know, call them, call them beach novels or whatever, you know, that you, you don't have to put too much thought into. You're just following the story. To 
Check out our podcast archive, suggest show topics, and advertise on the show. And to book me as a guest and or speaker, visit our website, www.fredopi.com. That's www.fredopi.com. For information about advertising on the show, please email us at fdopie at gmail.com. That's fdopie at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and be good.